Okay, how are we doing? Good. It's nice to see you all, even though I can't really see you all. There you are. I can see you now. So there's some good things and some bad things about being in this fabulous old theater. So let's focus on the good things. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. My job is to welcome you to the conference, the new tour, Innovations in Place-Based Storytelling. I want to welcome you to Brown University and welcome you to the... Um, I guess beautiful is right, the fabulous Avon Theater. Um, I'm Susan Smullyan. I'm the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. That's a big mouthful. I always stop after I say it. Um, and we're one of the co-sponsors of the conference. And I wanted to just spend a minute explaining the thoughts we had as we were pulling this together. First, most people, when they meet me or when I see them for the first time, want to know the definition of public humanities. And as the MA in public humanities students will tell you, such a definition is a work in progress. It's always evolving. In fact, studying what constitutes public humanities is part of our work. But that's what you expect from an academic, right? The scholar. I'm not actually going to tell you anything. I'm going to say, oh, we're continuing to think about it. Now let me try and do a little better than that. We founded the center at Brown about a dozen years ago. And as our mission statement says, the center features education, research, and public engagement initiatives to connect individuals and communities to art, history, and culture. So the jewel in the crown, we have an innovative MA program, bringing in 10 students a year in a two-year program with a summer practicum. Would the MA students who are here raise your hands? Yeah, there they are. Maybe not all 20 of them. Some people have classes on Thursday afternoon, but you'll meet the rest of them uh, tomorrow. Um, they will do the introductions, mostly during the conference. They come from all over, and they're dedicated to the idea that work in nonprofits, arts, and culture will change the world. And I hope they're right. Um, at the Center for Public Humanities, we also host faculty and community fellows, a couple of postdocs, and a range of programs, including conferences like this one. You'll hear about some of our programs and from some of our fellows during the conference. We collaborate with the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and the Rhode Island Historical Society on a set of mobile tours available as a cell phone app called Road Tour. We serve as a home for UPP Arts, born the Urban Pond Procession, led by one of our fellows, Holly Ewald, who's going to talk later today. Our faculty fellows, Monica Martinez and Dietrich Neumann, will also tell you about their projects. We think this work that is, you've, I've just talked about, the collaborating with community partners, faculty members thinking how to engage the public in and with academic research is at the center of the public humanities. So the conference highlights some of the work we do and brings us into conversation with exciting practitioners from around the country. When I became director of the center a year ago, I noticed the rising interest in tours among our collaborators and our faculty. At the time, my shorthand was tours of the new black. Um, <laughs> And I thought it would be great to have a conference that brought together a range of people who don't often get a chance to talk and listen to each other. So from the local to the national, practitioners to students and faculty, digital and analog. These are our sort of divides, um, but I think we're today and in the uh, tomorrow and in the sessions, we're going to be talking across those divides. Now, none of this would have been possible without the imagination research skills, organizational um, acumen, and enthusiasm of Marissa Brown. Uh, she conceived the conference, and what you're about to enjoy today is the result of her hard work. I also need to thank center manager uh, Sabina Griffin, who basically made all this happen, and our colleague Hong Chow, um, and several other colleagues uh, who've now come to help us uh, from Brown's Instructional Technology Group and Computer Services Group, um, stepped in to make sure you'd see and hear all the great images. So be sure to say thank you when you see them. I say it now to all of them. If you have more questions about public humanities, about our work, about Brown, I hope you'll find me and ask. Um, now I want to call on the other co-sponsor of the conference to say a few words, and then we can get started on the first panel. This is Richard Glass from Bryant University. My name is Richard Glass, and I'm co-director of the Advanced Applied Analytics Center at Bryan University. Our center was founded about three years ago, and really we have three pillars. One is education, the other is research, 
And the third is community involvement in the field of analytics. Uh, we are really dedicated to education at all levels. Last summer, we ran an analytics camp, five-day camp for high school students. We had about 40 students come, and they taught me a few things. So in any case, uh, about a year ago, we started talking about how we can apply analytics in the field of cultural studies and humanities. And from that conversation, here I am today. I'm absolutely delighted to greet everybody. Uh, I understand that a number of you will be talking about analytics over the next day or two. I'm really interested to hear what you say, learn more about the field, and our center is very much behind this initiative, and we're planning to help in all the analytics analysis that we possibly can. So thank you very much for coming. I'll leave some information out tomorrow at the tables at the back. If anybody wants to contact me or find out about some of the things that do in a little more detail, please feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you. So now we're looking for Maggie Goddard, who's going to introduce Denise Pinto. Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Unversat Goddard. I am a first year PhD student in American Studies and also doing a Master's in Public Humanities. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Denise Pinto, the Executive Director of Jane's Walk, a global movement of free, citizen-led walking tours inspired by urban activist Jane Jacobs. At Jane's Walk, she oversees local and international programming advocates for the use of walking as a platform for promoting connected communities and directs the assessment of the project's charitable impact. As a digital urbanist, she thinks deeply about co-opting emerging tech to shape better cities and advocates for the use of digital tools to enable open government, sharing economies, and the global organizing of DIY citizen projects. Please welcome Denise Pinto. I've got a sneak peek at my slides over there, but that's okay. We'll try and make it interesting the second time around. Um, thanks so much to uh, Brown University for hosting me, and I'm excited to kick things off, but also really interested, re really excited to learn from all of you uh, over today's session and tomorrow. So I want to start with a story uh, about my childhood. I grew up in a suburb of Toronto in Canada, and uh, my parents immigrated from Pakistan in the 80s and settled in a solidly middle-class neighborhood full of restaurant owners and insurance brokers and mechanics and school teachers. Uh, almost everyone on the block had arrived from somewhere, from China, from Japan, from Iran, from Greece, from South America, and we, our family, knew almost everyone on the block. If I needed help with my math homework, there was an accountant neighbor. Uh, who was just a few doors away, and if someone was ill, many hands were ready with food. I'll acknowledge that I'm looking through rose-colored glasses with a bit of nostalgia, but lately there's a quiet worry that seems to be spreading, that we don't know our neighbors face to face anymore, that we don't care to because we have the comfort uh, and convenience and the company of our phones and our social feeds. And of course, that's not my perspective, and. Uh, and maybe I'll find out that's not many of yours either. Here's one of my, one of my favorite web comic artists, Zen Pencils. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he illustrates famous quotes, uh, famous people, and, uh, and does a beautiful job reinterpreting what their, th what, what their words mean. Um, he's driving the point home here. We, we love our screens, but maybe they're a bit antisocial. But I would say, the thing is, we've always... <laughs> Being distracted, we've always been distracting ourselves from each other. And this meme, uh, this is an image that was circulating called "Technology is making us antisocial." But digital tools are just that—they're tools, and like analog tools before them, they serve a purpose. Um, and my interest is in tech plus urbanism, so cities. Uh, so as we stream into urban centers in greater numbers than ever before. 
we have got to confront this issue of neighborliness and connectedness, IRL, in real life. <laughs> According to the UN, 54% of the world's population lives in urban centers today. This is a diagram from the World Wildlife Fund Living Planet Report, uh, and you can see the spread of our population centers. By 2050, that number jumps to 66%. Two out of every three people. Cities, therefore, are important places to look at and to think about. How do we accommodate the needs of all kinds of people living in close proximity? Knowing neighbors is a, really, is a key to a socially resilient place, one that can adapt, uh, a place that can adapt as environmental and economic forces push and pull us. And as mass migration into cities draws us together, our digital tools offer us a way to understand the places around us and the stories of how, they, how they're used. Uh, this picture is of a, a swimming pool in Toronto that in the summertime when the outdoor pool is open, it's filled with rainbow trout so that inner city kids can go fishing. And it's just one of the examples of something that is brought alive by storytelling through a walking tour. I'm going to talk a little bit more about walking tours soon. So I run a global charitable project called Jane's Walk. And uh, at its core, it gets people face to face, walking together, and sharing stories about the places that they live, work, and play. Together, on these neighbor-led tours, people generate community-based solutions to problems that seem daunting. They discuss their shared stake and what they see around them. And largely, Jane's Walk, the project office, uses digital tools to help convene all of these organizers. The project was inspired by this woman, woman who I'm sure many of you know, Jane Jacobs, civic activist and writer. Um, her 1961 book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, is still so relevant and has become something of a textbook for urban designers and landscape architects and architects around the world. The book is a series of observations on what makes a good city and what hurts a city from her middle class perspective. And the opening page is really, really interesting. If you've never had a chance to open the book, it says, the scenes that illustrate this book are all about us. For illustrations, please look closely at real cities. While you're looking, you might as well also listen, linger, and think about what you see. Isn't it marvelous? It's so great, I get shivers. So Jacobs extolled the virtues of deeply observing everyday places. And at Jane's Walk, we encourage people to do just that. To reflect, to question, to collectively reimagine what seems set in stone and often is made of stone. Um, and so I'm going to play a really quick video and then we'll come back to talking about this. Jane Jacobs was an urban activist and writer. An urbanist is somebody who's really passionate about cities, who really cares about the places that they live and work and play. Jane Jacobs really wanted people to get out and explore and observe their cities and contribute to making their cities better places. Those who admired her ideas really wanted to remember her legacy and they thought, what better way to do it than to get people out walking and connecting with their neighbors? wanted to know about uh, the neighborhoods that people lived in. In order to see them, you walk. In order to understand them, you look. And that's what we've been doing today, is seeing, looking, and interpreting what it is that we see 
so that we better understand that which we walk through day by day in the neighborhood. So I think these uh, walks are great. They just get you to learn a little bit more about your area and appreciate it. I've passed this place so many times before and never had no idea how historical it is. It's great that it's free, it brings the community together, people learn about the history of the neighborhoods. It's amazing to see what's changed over the years. We're just trying to learn more about the city, find out more about the culture. Get outside, it's a nice day. There are a lot of great reasons to give a Jane's Walk. Maybe you want to talk about a project that you're starting up, or a community service that you use, or maybe you just want to go on a stroll and show off all the beauty that's in your neighborhood. Jane's Walk is about sharing information and getting to know your neighbors and have them engage in, in the community. So my purpose for this walk is to tell people what I know about the area, but I'm also going to ask questions and encourage people to either fill in the blanks or correct me if I'm wrong. We're taking neighbors and people from all around the Toronto area and far beyond around this neighborhood to stop at some of the sites where refugees get help uh, and where refugees become part of our community in Toronto. Our attempt is going to be to show our neighbors and from across the city a little bit about how our ethnically and globally diverse neighborhood is a really exciting place to walk around, but also a terrific place to go for dinner. Jane's Walk can be big or it can be small. It can be an intimate conversation or it can be a huge community celebration. Walking is critical to a city because it provides the opportunity to really know where you live and to know the people that you live with. You can start by going for a walk, but it's not important. Where are you going? What are you really interested in seeing and talking about? And then go online to janeswalk.org where our website will help you plot the route and put it up as a website share with all your friends. So that's kind of a little cheat so that I don't have to do so much talking. I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, so Jane was a citizen critic. She was not a formally trained planner. And uh, I'm really interested in that. I think the distinction is one that comes up uh, you know, through our work quite a bit. Uh, for example, I'm a, as a citizen, I'm invested in what happens in my neighborhood uh, at a very particular scale. Will that trail be removed? Will that garden project be funded? Will we put a bike lane here? But I'm also trained as a landscape architect, and so I'm acutely aware that I've developed a certain confidence in my opinions about public spaces. I understand that the built environment is a series of design decisions, things that can be changed. This isn't, of course, true for everyone, and the likelier venue for sharing public opinion on civic spaces often looks something like this, a town hall meeting. For me, the situation is problematic in two ways. It's reactive and it's exclusive. Reactive because it responds to an already decided upon change in the community and exclusive because typically a narrow group of people self-select to participate. So, sorry, people who have the time, people who are aware of the process, who are confident enough to share their opinions um, and confident enough, enough to feel like they have a say. It can be pretty nerve-wracking to be there, uh, full of sharp opinions flying around the room. Even I felt lost in the jargon at times. But what if we flip these words? You get proactive and inclusive. That's the kind of format we need, and I think Jane's Walk fits this to a T. People come out on community walking tours because they're fun. They come out with a great deal of positivity and curiosity to meet their neighbors. They may meet people who are different than them, but the act of walking and exploring together quickly bonds a group through a shared social experience. As the video said, Jane wrote that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they're created by everybody. And so at the heart of this project, we have a complex question. How do we raise up the non-expert? How do we allow for or foster or provoke creation by everybody? I think Jane's Walk does this in three ways. It creates an accessible format that everyone can contribute to. Two, it transcends age, class, 
race, gender, and ability. And three, it's a really simple idea. A few years ago, my colleague and I had a Skype conversation with a Jane's Walk leader from a small medieval town in Slovenia, and it really stuck with me. She told us how she had started to walk her five-year-old daughter to school every day. Um, and what an incredible experience that was for her to get to know her daughter as a person, someone with ideas and questions about herself and the world around her. How did I miss out on this for so many years, she asked us, driving my daughter to school. It must be a Slovenian problem, a uniquely Slovenian problem that we're so stuck in a culture of driving cars everywhere. My colleague and I were dumbfounded. Cars, a Slovenian problem? Jane Jacobs and many others wrote plenty about building cities for people, not cars. And as North Americans, we felt like this was our planning issue, <laughs> uh, the one that we continue to struggle with the most. But of course, this walk leader was not talking about collective experience or theoretical planning principles. She was talking about her own story and her own realization. And what's more, the prospect of leading a community walking tour helped her pin down the idea. That's the value of walking as a method of thinking. And what about the big picture? Well, for our Slovenian walk leader, her intent was to inspire her neighbors to walk their kids to school. And she isn't alone. There's a growing movement of parents doing the same in many, many cities. So I would say that at Jane's Walk, we're interested, I'm interested, as a digital urbanist, in the big picture. I want storytelling to help all of us, designers, historians, architects, people in public humanities, policymakers, see the patterns in aggregate at a regional or even global scale. As a shoestring charitable project, we run on people power with hundreds of local volunteers and thousands more around the world contributing their time to answer emails, to promote walking tours, to engage local media outlets, and recruit in interesting voices in their communities to take part. So to capture the global picture, we rely on web-based tools to connect the dots between stories. Together, we can compare notes. What's succeeding as a strategy? What can we learn from each other? What things are feasible and beautiful and far-reaching? From 27 walks in 2007, the project spread like wildfire in the last near decade across Canada and the US and now to 189 cities in six continents. So it's transcended cultures and language barriers. From Detroit to Dubai, we've attracted a peer-to-peer -peer network of passionate citizen urbanists who are opening up the dialogue about the needs of cities everywhere. And from our tiny office in Toronto, we use our website to help anyone, anywhere, take this on. Even this six-year-old boy, Halim, from Colchester, United Kingdom, leading a walk with his four-year-old brother to show landscape architects around their local park. Here he is holding up a little Jane's Walk guidebook. Their favorite thing is to slide down the hill on their bums. Over the near decade since the project began, we've used a host of online and offline methods to equip people with the license to tell their own stories, to think about the spaces and places around them. Here's an exercise we use at workshops where people come together to hash out their ideas for walking stories. It's called the city secret. We hand these slips of paper out at the door as people come in the room, and the slips ask people to write down a place they know in their city that's special to them. It says, I know of a place that blank, located at blank, you should do what there, because why would you go there? And often people say they don't know what to write because the places they visit feel so routine. And I ask them to take a leap and to jot down something, a park, a monument, a food truck, a, a memory. And after about five minutes, we share with the whole group. And the person who reads is always amazed to find out that not many people in the room have the same experience as them. Not many people in the room know the same things they do. What's extraordinary to you is, what's ordinary to you is extraordinary to other people. At some of our workshops, we make mind maps of civic ideas and questions that relate to a handful of themes, this one on tech. Uh, when we started with the theme tech, people began brainstorming 
places in their community like maker spaces, music halls, pumping stations, just a flood of good ideas to start tours. And in partnership with community centers, we run workshops to help people communicate the value they see around them through neighborhood walks, particularly in neighborhoods where residents feel their story has been co-opted by the media, profiled as crime-ridden. We've taken a page from Asset-Based Community Development, ABCD, um, in which people draw maps of their neighborhoods and identify the strengths, the capacities, and the assets that are all around them. Maybe it's a heritage building, maybe it's a nearby stream, an independent business, a unique hangout. Sometimes they talk about local celebrities or urban legends. In one workshop, in a group in Burlington, a city just outside of Toronto, told of staircases leading down into a local ravine. And these staircases apparently were surreptitiously built by a neighbor who no one had ever met. And they decided to lead a Jane's Walk tour of the staircases to celebrate them in all their anonymity and wonder, um, and, and to think about this anonymous do-gooder. So they'd just begun the walk when someone spied a person climbing the stairs coming towards them, a gentleman with his arms full of lumber. Uh, so sometimes when you put these tours on, you really meet the very person that you want to meet. We ask people to think about walking and walkability. After all, walking is, for us, an indicator action. It's uh, where there are people walking, there's usually a vibrant and animated place. And I loved that about my two hours ago, took a walking tour of Providence, and it was, it's just wonderful, the scale the, um, of the buildings and the heritage value here. Um, where it's harder to get around on foot, there are so many challenges to community building. In a tower community in downtown Toronto, a group of women led a Jane's Walk to show people from their neighborhood and beyond what walking to the grocery store looks like in a place where fresh food is not readily available. Negotiating an environment built for cars, they expertly marched a parade of people to the nearest grocery store, a half hour away, and walked back with bags in tow full of food, demonstrating just how difficult it is for newcomers with no driver's licenses to connect to vital services. Often social justice questions like these emerge on walks. And lo-fi solutions too, because there you have the community, the very people invested in that place. So a fence removed, a path repaired, very small things can make such a big difference. And the walks offer multiple perspectives, a window into how different people in different communities experience the very same place. There's no one story of a, of a place, of course. It's worth noting that in many cities, the project operates in a totally grassroots space, read zero budget but its lightweight format is the reason it's had such a broad uptake. And we believe in the power of online tools to facilitate this kind of face-to-face -face interaction and to connect neighbors to each other and to the places they care about, to capture empathy, articulate community vulnerability, to share lived experiences, to revel in complexity, and to think about building dialogue in situ, in the place where you are. Jacobs was really powerful in this regard because she identified common problems with the persuasion of specific ideas. She described Greenwich Village with its ballet of school children and market vendors coexisting and co-supported by shared public space. And Greenwich Village is one example of why that value is worth cultivating in lots of places. So we have a dearth of these place-based stories and we think they're leading us to a kind of urban literacy, a knowledge of ourselves and our communities. But these stories are only so good as their ability to be points of departure for other types of action. A few years ago, we ran a special series of walks called Global Conversations. We put out a call for five cities to join us in this experiment. Our proposal was this, take one theme and over the course of one month, have people in five cities lead a walk on the theme. And here's the catch, because the walks weren't all happening at once, we provided an opportunity for participants to share insights and provide questions to the next city, kind of like passing the baton. So the global conversation began in Guadalajara in Mexico with the theme of walkability, and there civic activists and artists made use of a really novel tool, a simple wooden picture frame. They painted one side of the frame red, and the slides are in black and white, but you'll use your imagination, and the other side green, and they set out to do the route that they'd chosen. As they walked, they asked people to identify what they liked and they didn't like about the places around them. 
And when something discussed something they liked, the green frame was held up. And when they didn't like it, the red frame. And they took a photo through the frame. Street art, green frame. Broken sidewalks, red frame. <laughs> this sim you're awake, good. <laughs> The simple method of auditing the walking environment was posted online via Instagram and was shared with the next city in the conversation, which was Sao Paulo in Brazil. Sao Paulo loved the idea and decided to incorporate it too. So here we go, sidewalk planters with banana trees, green frame, fences blocking the pathways, red frame. So utility poles decorated with tile, green frame, and on and on. And it made its way to Calcutta, which is pictured on the right, uh, where the conversation again looked at chai valas in open parks, and more and more photos went online through Twitter and Instagram. Color coding and social media in that instance, and this was in 2013, helped bridge language barriers and physical divides. It offered a snapshot of common issues across five different cities around the world, and it let us see and evaluate the circumstances that make our cities the same and different. So on that note, I'm going to end by sharing something that we're working on. We are really inspired by this kind of exchange and so many others um, that have come forward through Jane's Walks. So to see the potential for our work to integrate with already successful online tools, we decided that we're interested not just in storytelling, but in story finding. We embedded Twitter and Instagram and SoundCloud into our social mapping application to encourage people to do a kind of social research for global challenges, not that we characterize it as such for them, but to wonder about if their stories, if the stories that they capture through their own personal profiles could suture up to each other and offer unique insights. We ask people to simply go outside, to walk with a friend, and uh, to document what they see around them, as so many already do. And we aren't trying to exclude people who aren't familiar or comfortable with these tools. Rather, we found it's opened up a new opportunity to engage potential walk leaders. Young people who perform their lives through social media easily create narratives by uploading their tweets and photos onto our map um, and then sharing it with their friends. We also see potential for this around the world. Widespread mobile devices have made it possible to capture and record stories in an unprecedented way. In Kisumu, Kenya, our walk leader, Karen, uh, who's pictured on the right in the middle, uh, wanted to talk about gender violence and women's safety in her village. They walked for two hours, telling stories, taking notes, zeroing in on one central question during the walk, and this is Karen's words, how can we possibly grow a city when it's not safe for our women? And when they finished, they compiled a list of challenges and solutions and went and took them to the village chief. And when Karen relayed the story to us over Skype, she said he was so receptive and allied to her cause, but that he wasn't the only one capable of making changes. And I think that's really powerful. Walking and being together face to face was raising awareness and putting the issues in human terms. All the people on the walks, that's who became the allies. It can help if we all make small individual changes that together make a difference. So to go back to my opening to that suburban neighborhood where I grew up, Today, it continues to be a landing spot for a number of immigrants. And though there's an Iranian and Korean community living right on top of one another, they often don't have the opportunity to interact. So through a Jane's Walk just this year, we were able to show and tell each other about our cultures, our traditions, our customs, and see something, see something through your neighbor's eyes. That led to some really incredible expressions of empathy and community building. I encourage everyone in this room to use walking as a tool to get neighbors together and start the conversation and to check us out at janeswalk.org uh, and try our mapping tools. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for a great start of this uh, conference, uh, the first talk with Denise. Um, my name is Inge Zwart. I'm a first-year MA student in 
Public Humanities Program at Brown, and I'm here to introduce Therese Kelly, um, architect, artist, editor, and co-founder of the Los Angeles Urban Rangers. Um, she works at the intersections of landscape, urban design, and architecture, uh, which result in, for example, um, the planning and designing of major urban spaces in Los Angeles, like the award-winning Grand Park. And with the LA Urban Rangers, uh, she invites people to explore public space through engaging and creative interactive tools uh, and public installations. And as the name suggests, a lot of it happens in Los Angeles, but I was very excited to uh, see also the On Deck uh, project uh, by the LA Urban Rangers, which is located in my home country, the Netherlands. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Therese Kelly. Thank you so much for that um, warm introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, as, um, as you know, I'm from Los Angeles. I, I moved there about uh, 15 years ago. And um, we're here at this conference on storytelling. And Los Angeles is really the epicenter of storytelling. With the Hollywood industry, um, we're writing, writing and filming and exporting and telling stories all the time. Um, and I just want to, by show of hands, has anyone lived in L.A. or visited L.A.? The audience? Okay, maybe about half. Well, even those of you who um, haven't been to L.A., you know L.A., right? You know the stories that we tell about L.A. Like, what are the stories that L.A. tells about itself? It's um, a city of smog. It's a city of, like, intense traffic congestion. Like, we have this term, like, Carmageddon. Um, it's sort of like a fake place. There's all these celebrities and like fancy homes, private spaces, the Silicon Enhanced, right? So of all the stories that LA tells, the, the stories about itself, is it never really gets right, the stories about itself. And whether all those stories I just said are true or not, what I'm here to tell you today is a new story of Los Angeles, and that is that Los Angeles is a city of nature. In fact, all cities are places of nature. And I'm going to talk with you about two projects, one on downtown LA, which I've done with my collective, the Los Angeles Urban Rangers, which I'll get to in a moment, and the other through um, a project called I Heart Water that I've done with my, um, my soul design practice. So, so just a little bit about myself. I'm an architect. I work in um, public spaces, creating public spaces, working with communities, to create um, vibrant places that they want to go to, to celebrate and gather, whether it be just small pocket parks or um, huge master plans of open spaces. But at the heart of my practice recently has been the Los Angeles Urban Rangers. And at this point, you're probably wondering who or what is the Los Angeles Urban Rangers? Well, <clears throat> we are a group, a collective of, um, artists and writers and architects and um, environmental historians. And uh, we get together and uh, we dress up like park rangers and we talk about the city with the same sense of wonder and curiosity and discovery that you normally reserve for places like Yosemite or Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon. And we talk about our everyday landscapes with that same sense. So we give guided hikes of the city we um, set up welcome stations and we do alternative mappings. Um, and we, we create interpretive toolkits that you can take out in the field and really understand your everyday landscape. Um, this, the, at any given time, there's like from two to 25 rangers. The four founders uh, are myself, Emily Scott, um, Jenny Price, and Sarah Delayden. And um, we first started by giving uh, campfire talks in a gallery um, for an exhibit on art and the environment. And we talked about such things as urban foraging and um, freeway landscaping, um, industrial habitats. And um, at the time, we created a mapping guide. I'm the resident cartographer of the group, so I always like to talk about our maps. But just like um, when you go to a national park, you get um, a mapping guide. And so we created our own 
um, icons that really describe uh, Los Angeles. And we depict Los Angeles as though it were a national park. And many Angelinos, when they see this map, they don't actually recognize their own city because it's rendered as a place of nature. Um, and that's really the heart of our project, is really like looking with new eyes at these places that we look at every day. So we've given hikes of Hollywood Boulevard. We've given um, hikes of the LA County Fair, which we've posited as a sort of a cycle of production and consumption and waste systems. And uh, we sort of summed it all up in this diagram of a geography of a corn dog. Our, um, our most uh, celebrated and longest running project was our project on Malibu Public Beaches, which I'm not gonna go into detail here today, but basically we've taken a place that has been um, marked, um, marked as private when it's actually public, shown people where the public beaches are in a highly contested space, and we give safaris, or we, we have given safaris, and show people how to find and use their public beaches. So here people are measuring their public easements, um, and we have them practice public, typical public beach behaviors on these beaches that don't usually see the public. So they're wildlife watching, sunbathing, reading trashy Hollywood magazines, um, uh, sandcastle building. And uh, the map and guide that we created for that project has been uh, reprinted multiple times, translated translated into Spanish and um, is now actually used by state agencies in their discussions about coastal access. So it's been a really successful project. So why do we dress up like park rangers to talk about the city? Well, for one thing, park rangers are instantly recognizable and they are the authority on nature. They're also very friendly, they encourage participation and they have a curiosity about the places where they serve. And in fact, they only serve in public spaces, in, in our most endeared public space. So if we want to talk about nature and public space in the city, it's a great tool to dress up like a park ranger. To go into a little bit more depth, I want to talk to you about our project Public Access 101, downtown LA. And our idea of Public Access 101 is really that Public access and public space is absolutely essential to vibrant democratic cities, essential to sustaining healthy, equitable communities, healthy ecosystems, and healthy public life, and a healthy civic discourse. And we do this through looking at two landscapes in downtown Los Angeles. One is our financial district, which is called Bunker Hill, and the other is the Los Angeles River, which is right next to downtown. And Bunker Hill is a very disoriented place and disjointed um, pedestrian realm. There are, um, there are uh, actually, a, pedestrian life is separated from the street, so the street life is really devoid of life, and, but it's really confusing to know how to get to these elevated um, walkways, and even cars, the car um, traffic is separated. There's also, the public spaces have been highly privatized, so it's very, kind of disconcerting to know if you're allowed to go into these places, to know how you can behave when you're there. Um, and then the Los Angeles River lies sort of remotely on the edge of downtown, cut off uh, by infrastructure and regulation and forgetting. Um, so what do we do? To address the sort of navigational challenges of Bunker Hill, we do orientation activities. These people are um, pointing to where they think north is. Um, and we use the Bonaventure Hotel, which is in the background, one of the uh, most famous postmodern dystopian sort of disorienting places as um, an orientation tool. In fact, the, the four towers of the Bonaventure mark directly to the uh, directions on the compass. So we have people uh, go up in the elevator towers and record what they see in the view sheds to really use this as an orientation um, device and we lead guided hikes. We take them on this convoluted pedestrian path. We show them where the um, where the escalators and overpasses are, and we take them through what we call the corporate meadows and uh, landscape of corporate meadows and corporate peaks. Uh, we also use um, a field activity observation log, and not only to just record what people are seeing, but also sort of William White type observation man um, planning 
tool of really observing how these spaces, how people behave in these spaces, how you feel in these spaces. And we take people to um, the McGuire Gardens Corporate Meadows. And, um, and we ask them, you know, do you think this place is public or private? And I thought it would be fun today to just to ask you all whether or not you think this place is public or private. I'll give you a little bit more background because you were not there. It is, um, it's called the McGuire Gardens. It's right in front of LA's Central Public Library. It's on a very prominent street corner, Fifth and Flower in downtown. It's very well manicured lawns. It's a passive park where you can sit and stroll. Um, so just by show of hands, if you think it's public or private, everyone, everyone who thinks this place is public. Okay, and everyone who thinks it's private. Okay, so actually, the majority of people that raise their hands think that it is public. Well, in fact, when you're on the ground, there's absolutely no way that you can tell. So fortunately for us, we've developed the Urban Rangers Corporate Meadows hotline, which we can call right now. And I'm going to do that. Hopefully the sound is working. Sounds, I don't think this. It, it, it just, it, it's supposed to start. Um, well, it's a really nice range of voice that answers, but I actually have the answer for you on the next slide. That meadow is public land with a private lease, with a public easement on the private lease, with private security and maintenance. So it's not even really clear if it's public or private, right? And this is just one example of many in downtown. This area of downtown was um, developed, uh, sort of conceived in mid-century and developed mostly in the 80s and 90s with really, I think, well-intentioned planning incentives to ask the, to task the private sector to create our public realm. And this is, this is the result. So this is our landscape that we have in downtown LA. And um, so you, you, even the people that work there and make private uh, security, they, they actually don't know what is allowed. And it's, it's really interesting. So one of the things that we're going to do next that we'd like to do with this project is to take that idea of the, of the hotline and turn it into a mobile app. This is a, 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 the next step of our project where you could just be there and say, is this place public or private? You could find out how to connect these pedestrian systems. You could ask and find out about what is an air right, what are public easements, how is this landscape really layered and put together, and hopefully have a sort of data collection aspect to it where people can really report on what they're seeing and how they're feeling and hopefully create meaning from that data. Um, just to give a little feel, a little bit better feel of, of, of who we are in action, I'm going to attempt to play a quick little two-minute video for you.
for the Los Angeles River. Los Angeles exists because of the LA River. The city of Los Angeles was founded on the banks, or near the LA River, and the LA River provided water for the city solely for the city's first, guess how many years? 130 years. You know, my, my grandfather actually moved to Los Angeles in the 1930s, during the Depression. He moved to Atwater Village. When he was a boy, he swam in the LA River, and he fished in the LA River. It looks like a river down there. Yeah. Like, off the side, you're like, off the side. Oh, is this a river? So a little bit more about the LA River. As you can, as you heard that uh, last participant said, once he finally got down there, he said, oh, there is a river here. Um, because a, as you may know, uh, the, actually the LA River has been getting a lot of attention recently, um, both uh, from the political sector and uh, federal funding. Frank Gehry is now on board doing a new master plan. So there's a lot of attention toward revitalizing the LA River. But if you ask anyone on the street, where is the LA River? they have absolutely no idea. It has really been um, completely cut off from the rest of the city. So what do we do? We bring people down the river. We say, come on down for an LA River Ramble. And we have a community event. And we just take people down into the river. Now, the, you can't just take people down into the river. You actually have to get permission from the city to access this public space. We have permits. Everyone has to have a waiver. So what we do is we have this permit, permit origami sort of like soft you know, dissonance, um, and people can create steelhead trout or um, blue, great blue heron, which are species that hopefully will return to the river. And we set up a backcountry ranger station, and we give out our own permits and our own maps, and our permit is a backcountry permit because the city has become such a remote territory as, as though it's in the backcountry. And our permit, when you sign it, it acknowledges that you're entering a public space, and um, you're acknowledging that the Los Angeles River is a river and not a flood control channel. And we created um, an, L, you know, a, 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 of course, I'm going to talk to you about the map that we created. It really shows the LA River as, um, as a connective tissue between the neighborhoods on either side of it. And it talks about what the current ecology and biota are, whether, you know, and gentrification. So whether it's the black neck stilt or the black clad film crew. This is actually the area where the, most of the filming on the LA River uh, occurs. We call it the most famous forgotten river in America. Um, but mostly it's about going to the river and having fun and enjoying this place as citizens of a city together. Um, hundreds and hundreds of people come out whenever we've done this. I mean, on the order of like 500, 700 people at a time. Um, and it's really about just coming together, experiencing this place as a public space. You sort of need the public there to make it into a public space. And being able to imagine it and re-envision it as what it could be, what it could become. We also have a fun thing called the water bar. Um, and we have bartenders. And we uh, really trying to get people to think about the river as a source of water because it's been so forgotten. So we have two flights. We have tap and, you know, on tap and bottled. And um, depending on where you live in Los Angeles, your water could be coming from the Colorado River, it could be coming from the Eastern Sierras, it could be coming from Mount Shasta in Northern California. And so people can sample the water from different places and see what it tastes like. Um, and it's really about this personal encounter with, um, with the river and with the water you know, somebody recently w said to me, you know, my water comes from 400 miles away? And I thought, you know, that actually is a story that the LA, LA has gotten right. Like, have you not seen Chinatown? But I didn't say that. I said, yes, your water comes from 400 miles away. Look at this map that I created. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but mostly it's about that personal encounter with this space that everyone sort of th thinks they know, but they don't really know. And... Um, and just appreciating it as part of our, our, of our everyday life. And on that note, I, the last project that I want to talk to you about is called I Heart Water, How's Your Water Relationship? And it's a project I did for UC Santa Barbara. University of California, Santa Barbara was looking at 
the idea of sea level rise, and they wanted to engage students on campus with that idea, so they wanted to create some sort of engagement activity. Now, um, the campus is a coastal one. It's right on the, the Pacific coast, and that's sort of part of you know, how they sell themselves and their marketing materials. And I looked at, over time, this campus, and one thing that struck me is that this idea of the shoreline is a completely dynamic idea. It's not just one line. You know, and it's always shifting, not only um, from year to year, but from hour to hour, right, where the tides are. So that was my first sort of data visualization of this campus. And um, walking around in my site visits to the campus, um, there's not only an awareness of the shore and the ocean, but if you really are looking at it, there are so many encounters with water just anywhere you go. So like they have these drinking fountains they have three different kinds of filtered water. You can choose like if it's reverse osmosis filtered, if it's sand filtered. Um, they have, uh, you know, sustainable landscaping techniques with using uh, reclaimed water for irrigation. And they have a very uh, prominent marine sciences program there. So using all that um, kind of like experiential research of the everyday encounters with water, I developed an online questionnaire for the students and really thinking about uh, water as something that you are in relationship with in the same way you could have a, re a romantic relationship. So we developed this questionnaire that sort of is modeled on like a women's magazine style relationship questionnaire. So you can rate your water relationship, what first attracted you to water, how do you like to spend time with water, why do you stay in your relationship with water? And there were like multiple other questions. That's just a sample. And the next part of the project after the questionnaire was I developed a scavenger hunt that was map-based. So I looked at things like tsunami inundation maps, utility maps of how water gets to campus, whether it's you know uh, seawater or reclaimed water, how water leaves campus, what the stormwater system's like. Um, and some of the sustainable techniques they're, they're using with vernal pools, you know, what, what happens to water and um, what kind of organisms uh, depend on water. And also just looking at nautical maps and using that idea of, you know, this being a nautical uh, a place for the relationship to the sea. And I developed this scavenger hunt. There are seven stops on the scavenger hunt. This map is actually now part of the UC Santa Barbara campus map, so if you go there for orientation or if you want to take a tour, you can actually take this, this, um, this tour. And it's downloadable to your smartphone. And um, there's stops and, you know, this, all the stops have to do with our sort of daily, uh, uh, our daily encounters with water, whether it's sanitation, recreation, um, research, drinking. And um, it uses some of that uh, terminology from the, from the questionnaire. So like, for, for instance, um, using reclaimed water is sort of billed as giving water a second chance. And we sent people out on the scavenger hunt. This was a workshop that we did um, to kick it off. And then they came back and we asked them, um, you know, what did they observe and how did they feel? And we got so many comments that, I mean, people were just so enthusiastic, but a lot of the, the comments were like, you know, how easy it is to walk past something every day and not see it. And that's really the heart of, of what this project is about, is really paying closer attention to things that are in our everyday lives and really understanding them as a part of, um, as a part of our nature. Um, and just going back to the questionnaire, the last question we had is, is there anything like you'd like to change about your relationship with water? I mean, people answer this question either like very humorously or very personally, um, very sincerely. Some of my favorite ones I have here I feel like it's a one-sided relationship. I would like to give as much to water as it gives to me. I never really thought about my water relationship before, but now I appreciate and recognize that water really is a vital component to daily life. And my favorite is water is the best partner I've ever had. So ultimately, it's really through personal encounter with our everyday spaces and our everyday resources um, we can not only recognize our cities as places of nature, but we can actively participate in creating the city that we live in. What kind of city do we want to live in, and whose city is it?
Thank you. Um, well, as a graduate of UC Santa Barbara, I am honored to follow our previous speaker and to introduce um, Holly Ewald. First of all, I should also add that I'm Jim Egan in the English Department at Brown University. I also am the Senior Fellow at the Center for Public Humanities. And um, I'm pleased and honored to introduce Holly Ewald. Uh, for me, Holly's work, um, who is, she's a Fellow at the Center for Humanities here. She's an artist, she's a founder and artistic director of UPP Art, uh, which combines in, uh, art and environmental justice. Uh, her work epitomizes for me what the public humanities is and can be. And when my colleagues at Brown asked, and unfortunately they asked far too much, uh, what is public humanities, I always point to Holly's work. Um, I've learned a great deal of, from talking to her over the last few years since I've been at the center. Uh, from looking at her website, and I'm very much looking forward to her talk. So without further ado, here's Holly. Um, thank you very much. Um, especially, I want to thank Susan and um, Marissa for putting on such a wonderful conference, getting it all together. I know we're just getting started, but um, it looks to be um, a great conference. And um, thank you very much, Jim, for that kind introduction. And I'm very inspired by the first two presenters, and I look forward to more conversation. I'd like to begin by orienting all of us. Uh, this is a map of Providence, and um, up here is um, kind of where we are at the Avon. Here's Brown University, and uh, this is the Providence River that flows down into the Narragansett Bay. And the area that I'm going to talk about is kind of down in here, the southern part of Providence, and mainly here, Mashapog Pond, which is the last natural um, pond in Providence. Um, um, the waters from Mashbug Pond flow down into the Roger Williams Park Pond, which is the largest um, public park in, in Providence, and these up to a million people that come um, yearly uh, to that park. And then those waters go down into the Patuxent River and then into the bay. Um, and now I'd like to, to briefly introduce you to UPP Arts. Our mission is to celebrate history of place in communities around urban waters through arts and environmental education. For the past eight years, UPP Arts has engaged youth, families, and the community at large in arts and humanities-based workshops and events, emphasizing the environmental plight of local water bodies. More than seven, almost 700 students have been introduced to water quality issues, particularly the impact of stormwater runoff, and industrial toxins on Providence's hidden Mashabog Pond and the ponds in Roger Williams Park. UPP Arts helped these youth synthesize environmental lessons into the production of creative work ranging from a floating um, sculpture, ceramic mural, and stop motion animations to an adventure film, informational video, and pictorial signs. To increase awareness and knowledge, UPP Arts public workshops and events, including the annual procession that draws over 300 participants each year, have engaged the community, ultimately compelling change, we hope, in everyday habits that protect local waters and improve community health. But we are here to talk about tours. How does UPP Arts fit in? According to American Heritage College Dictionary, a tour is a trip with visits to various places of interest for business, pleasure, or instruction. Two, a group organized for such a trip or for a shorter sightseeing excursion. And three, a brief trip to or through a place for the purpose of seeing it. I'd like to give you an introduction to the UPP Arts way of thinking about a tour.
human race. My soul has gone deep like the rivers. If we're quiet enough, we can hear the water. So that's the Urban Pond procession, which happens once a year in mid-May, and next May will be our ninth procession. When I overheard Susan talking about designing a conference on tours last year, I spontaneously said, oh, the procession is a tour. And Susan looked at me and said, yeah. I hadn't really thought about it, intu but intuitively, I felt it was a tour of sorts. Families from the neighborhood, artists, environmentalists and concerned citizens gathered together to be guided from one place to another. And as you can see here, this, this is um, the flyer from our first procession. We started up here at the Wat Sarmakaram um, and traveled south down Buckland Street and then down to um, Alvarez High School, which was built on the former Gorham Silver Manufacturing site, um, and then down the um, east side of the pond and um, over res down, down Reservoir Avenue into a tiny little park, which not very many people even know about it because it's behind a strip mall, um, to the southern um, area of Mashapog Pond. And for many people, it's an opportunity to see places that they wouldn't know even know that are in Providence, um, much like we've talked about with the Jane's Walk. Um, and this was a, an opportunity for people to see the Wat Thormakaram, which is where we began the procession. And it's, it's just set there right in the middle of residential, a residential street. And the monks blessed us before we set off on our journey. And then we, uh, this is us going down Buckland Avenue, as I pointed out. And these are with signs that the, the students created um, and passing over a railroad um, overpass and down um, the residential street that was just along the east side of the, of the pond. And this area has never seen a procession, a parade, or anything like this before, so people were really curious. And then we had these big characters um, that you see on the right here the big Nazo puppets who always join us and always get everybody excited. And then we ended here, as I said, at this tiny little park at the southern end of the pond. And this is um, a photograph of kids from Community Music Works um, accompanying a friend who had written a rap to, um, to vi for violins, which um, was about the environment. And then each, each year, the, the route of the procession changes, so people get to see various different parts of Providence. But the change is dependent on the focus that we have for the year, because we do a series of workshops in schools. And this particular um, flyer is from the year that we were focusing on the industrial history. And um, we, you can see here, this is the route. This is our map. There's a map every, every year on our flyers. So we're going from the southern tip of Mashapog Pond and mimicking the flow of the waters from Mashapog down into the Roger Williams Park Pond and making people aware of the fact that all of the waters and all of the toxins from our industrial history have traveled that same route. So if you're downstream, you really need to care about upstream. Um, and then this flyer is from um, a year in which we focused on this area of Mashapog Pond, which is presently an industrial park. And um, we found that we delved, delved into the history of this area um, through some oral history programming, which I'll mention later a little bit more about, um, and found that this had a very rich um, history in terms of a neighborhood, probably one of the first integrated neighborhoods in Providence of 500 families that lived there and they were displaced 
in 1962 as part of Urban Renewal. So that year, um, we really focused on better understanding that neighborhood. And then this is a slide of the, the procession that year. And these um, houses that you see that people are carrying, those are actually lanterns. It was turned into an evening procession. And the houses are there to um, commemorate the lost houses from that neighborhood. Um, and this was from last year. We decided to just strictly focus on water. And once again, we mimic the flow, natural flow of the waters from Mashabog Pond into the Roger Williams Park Pond. Like most tours, there's information we want to share. And not with just the people who are in the procession, but the, the houses that we pass. So we hand out information to all the homes we pass so people learn about how to use Mashbug Pond safely and how to reduce pollutants from going into the pond. For the first few years, we asked government officials and the students to present rel um, relevant information to the crowds gathered. As Deputy Chief of Water Quality, Elizabeth Scott here, talked about the importance of volunteers to help monitor the ponds and residents to pick up pet waste and keep water on their own property to reduce it washing fertilizers, pesticides, and oil from our cars into the storm drains. But that first year, it was Anthony who made the biggest impression. Anthony's plea was more moving and memorable than anything Elizabeth could have said. It was heartfelt and urgent. He, he came over to me um, while his classmates were giving their very prepared speech. And he said, Holly, um, um, I know I wasn't supposed to speak, but could I get up there and say something? And of, and of course I said yes. And so he got up to the mic and sort of halting um, delivery, he, he said, you know, come on guys, I really want all of us to work together because I really want a place to play. So that was much more memorable than anything that any of us adults could say. And um, I always appreciate Anthony for that. Um, over the years, we found that, that few people were in the mood to listen for any length of time to any informational speakers. So now we primarily set aside time at the end of the procession for students to present what they've learned to the public. And this is a slide of um, the girls from Sophia Academy who had uh, learned about the textile industry in Providence and had um, created this clean river quilt, which they then carried in the procession. Um, sound amplification is always a challenge for us, and there's never enough time in the school workshops for the students to polish the presentation. And our biggest challenge is wanting to educate the public while also creating an environment to celebrate the natural water bodies in our neighborhood. And this is a slide of um, kids from City Arts here in Providence that had created percussion instruments that were um, made out of recycled materials. And this was during a year in which we were focusing on the indigenous history and really zeroing in on the fact that um, how resourceful the indigenous community was and what we could learn from that. Since 2010, we always stopped the procession by the water for a moment of silence to remember that we are processing in appreciation and recognition of water in our lives. Often there is a poem that is read, like you heard um, the girls in the video um, reciting the Langston Hughes poem. And in the past few years, an elder from the Narragansett tribe has delivered a blessing in thanks to Mother Earth for the water, spoken in English and in Narragansett. And this is a, a slide of uh, Lorenz Spears from the Tomahawk Museum, who's um, um, giving the the blessing. But the Urban Ponds procession is different than a traditional tour. The audience actually becomes the tour. As people arrive at the beginning of the procession, we invite them to put on costumes so they agree to step out of their traditional selves and become a fish, an activist with a sign, or a music maker at a celebration. They become part of the event and the big Nazo puppets inspire them to imagine alien creatures from the tainted Mashapog waters. Stepping into imagination and play breaks down barriers among us, 
creating a feeling of connection and community. We've had state senators, and here um, uh, is the Senator Juan Pichardo joining us, um, the head of the Providence Public School Department science curriculum, and yes, um, the deputy chief of water quality for the state, Elizabeth Scott, donning fish costumes, um, special hats, playing instruments, and dancing to the music of the bands. But one of my favorite memories is seeing reluctant teenagers from Alvarez High School smiling and dancing along with the beat of the band as we walked through the Huntington Industrial Park. Later, one of them said she enjoyed the procession because she got to talk with people she wouldn't ordinarily meet. And children also got, get to jam with adult musicians. And that was a thrill for, for these kids who had made those percussion instruments. Um, and they really got to jam with the, the regular bands that we had there. People come to the procession for various reasons. They are concerned about the fish and the health of our city ponds, especially Mashbog Pond, and want our government officials to know about it. They love a party with good music, food, and dancing in the street, being part of a community. For the students, they are presenting publicly what they have learned in school. They are the educators, and this is an introduction for them to civic engagement. So people not only have a chance to see that this part of Providence, whether it be the Watts Dormer Karam, the Huntington Industrial Park, the route, the Mashpog waters traveled to spill into the Roger Williams Park Pond, but they get to feel the community of Providence, which is rich and diverse. The Urban Pond Procession is becoming a tradition, a place where people of all ages, all backgrounds, all parts of the watershed come together to celebrate. They get to learn a bit about the significance of these places to the history of Providence and the environment. But the procession doesn't address all of our mission. And so I'm going to show you some of the things that we do that are not addressed in the procession. Each spring, I mean, each um, fall, we have a teaching artist and educators workshop to um, introduce uh, potential um, teaching artists who will do projects in the schools to the theme for the year. And we always have a fun hands-on activity as well. And here we were working on making vessel hats um, inspired by the Gorham Silver Manufacturing um, designs um, for vessels. And they, the requirement was that they needed to stay on your head and they needed to hold water because then that year, um, vessel hats were made with, the, with some of the students and they, we all carried water from Mashapog Pond down to the Roger Williams Park Pond on our heads and got to the sluice at, at Roosevelt Lake and um, bowed to the sluice and the water came down and emptied into the Roosevelt Lake at Roger Williams Park Pond. So it's a real visceral kind of understanding of, of, what, of the flow of the water as well as understanding that there's many cultures or being reminded that there's many cultures, many people all over the world who that is the only way that they do get water. And then every, um, at the beginning of every year, we have a community kickoff to share what our theme is for the year. And we have guest speakers and we have a hands-on activity. We also, um, this is, if you, heard me refer to workshops in the schools. We do workshops in the schools and in art um, centers and community centers. And this is a slide of um, a workshop to learn um, about making shadow puppets. And the, the um, goal of this, this project was to tell this, translate the story of the uh, displacement of that neighborhood, uh, the old West Elmwood neighborhood, um, which is now an industrial park to tell that story through shadow puppetry. And one of my favorite things about this photo is in the back, seeing that the, the teachers get to play as well. And then this is a slide of some students at Sophia Academy who were learning how to dye fabric um, as they were learning about the textile industry in Providence. And then they created that beautiful clean river quilt for the procession. Um, this is a, um, was the result of a, a collaborative project of students at Reservoir Elementary School, fourth and fifth graders, who were given the task of creating an interactive play, 
place based that um, took storm drain runoff in mind. And so they created this structure that had a stage like platform and would also catch water, direct it um, into um, a garden so that it would be used and not wasted down the storm drain. And this is a um, sort of more formal rendering. And at this um, point, this the stage-like platform has been constructed through the help of um, guidance of um, Down City Design and volunteers from the, the school helping to create it, to build it. And it should be finished by next um, spring in which we're going to do a project with the kids in which they will uh, plant a design and plant a garden. And that'll be part of the procession next year. Um, and this just shows we also do public workshops so that we reach out to the public in various kinds of ways. And it's a hands-on workshop, and for, usually for the kids. And then we tell the parents about the, um, our efforts and inform them about, about storm drain runoff. And the following, this was another year of a public workshop. We were focused on water, and we did some marbleizing and kids went home with a something that they could put on their refrigerator to remind them of the date of the procession. And this is a project which is a, um, a way that we were honoring the um, history of the West Elmwood neighborhood. And we planted fruit trees with um, volunteers. And this uh, was done la this past spring. And so in three years, we should have some fruit. And to build even more stewardship into this project we, and to protect the trees, we had a guardrail that was put in around the trees and we had a painting party to decorate that guardrail. And all of the, the information and history that has been gathered about this area, because it is an area that's really not been stood out as um, a place to sort of celebrate. It's more been a dumping ground um, the, the work that I did here at, at Brown's Public Humanities Program through a, a co-teaching and oral history class um, with an oral historian, um, Annie Bach, um, our students gathered um, about 50 oral histories from people who had some sort of connection with the um, pond and the area and also wrote research papers. So those have been incredible resources for our work and we're really trying to help um, bring that research into uh, to teachers in the school. And one of the great ways that um, this has been possible is introducing them to the Mashpog Pond Tour online, um, which was done through Road Tour, which you're going to be hearing more about um, later in this conference. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Mashpog Pond, you can always go to the Mashpog Tour on Road Tour. Thank you. Microphone here. How are we hearing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Pretty soon we'll get the lights. But in a minute. So I want to, could we just stop for a minute and thank these three wonderful speakers one more time? <laughs> this was terrific. It's really hard to imagine any better uh, talks or talks that went together <laughs> any better. Um, and I thought maybe I'd just stop for a minute and see if there was anything you wanted to ask each other um, as you were listening. They had, there are so many ways in which these um, presentations uh, interact, intersect. These are microphones too, so I don't need this one. I love that. Anybody got anything? Okay, no worries. Um, so I thought they interact, there were, there were three places where we might start a conversation. 
Uh, one is that I'm interested in the fact that all the projects, I'm so afraid I'm going to fall off the edge of the stage. Um, I was interested that all the projects in some ways were what Mark DeBow called this morning hybrid. Uh, they're both digital and analog. This isn't an idea that you have one and you don't have the other. Uh, we always have both. And I wondered, I thought maybe you'd want to say something about how the two pieces fit together. But then I was also thinking about the, um, the ways in which public and private work in the the stuff you're doing, so we call ourselves public humanities. But this is this is all about the public sphere and, and things that had meant to be private, which are we want to bring back to be public, and things that have always been public that we've forgotten about. Um, so there's a lot of public and private uh, stuff going on. And then all the stuff about civic engagement. How does this work that you're doing move people to action? Uh, what's the link between the stuff you're doing um, and the action we want people to take. I mean, that's always a hard moment. I, I, I didn't want to make the questions too easy. So is there anything <laughs> there that you um, have something else you want to talk about? Um, there's a lot of different possibilities. Maybe you'd each just take a minute and say something that this sparked in you. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start with public and private because I was, I was quite taken with the exercise that you were doing to explore the public easement on a private lease on public lands, which is, <laughs> I see I remembered it, did I do it right? Um, uh, we, we often encounter that with, uh, with Jane's Walks, and I'm speaking specifically locally, where uh, uh, people's perception of their cities is that, they, th that it's theirs, and the places that they walk are, um, are, are theirs, and they want to lead tours. Um, you know, in all sorts of spaces, but uh, one in particular that was very interesting was an underground, um, it was, it's a, a series of towers downtown and there's an underground pedestrian pathway, it's called the path, and, uh, and often we have this tenuous relationship with security. They're always attending our tours, <laughs> they love us, because there is, uh, the, it's all private, space and uh, and there's public access and we're and I don't think that the storytelling that citizens are providing necessarily talks about that negotiation in a really direct way rather people are exploring for the sake of exploring or because they use it or because to them it feels like part of the natural routine or habiture and so uh, so anyways I thought that was a very interesting parallel um, I would also say water is a is a is a really big kind of common thread uh, we have a lost rivers project that leads walks that do a very similar procession to yours and uh, um, and it's in fact led by a group called the homegrown Rangers so they <laughs> often wear hats <laughs> so uh, so I love I think that um, you know to your to your last question about community building and our uh, and and what comes out of this the face to the moment that people get together and are face to face with each other is uh, is a moment in which they exchange um, you know all kinds of interests and uh, and bring to bring to the walk their own capabilities and skills and so sometimes you'll have a realtor and uh, you know a student and a um, landscape architect and a, and somebody who is just makes really awesome fries and they and they mash these things together in really unique ways um, so those small scale kinds of collaborations are are what I see as the most compelling actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I was really struck too by the the sort of um, the s seamlessness between the presentations, like words that you were saying about. <clears throat> I, I felt like I could have said, you know, like the everyday, looking at the everyday with new eyes. And mm -hmm. so I think that there is there are probably similar, you know, if you look back at our, our sort of like foundational um, ideas, you know, that we're coming from similar places. In terms of the the digital and analog divide for our project. We've actually intentionally been very low tech mm -hmm. as a sort of way of like using the aesthetic to get that idea of the of the you know the park service and being out there in the wilderness and sort of using the low tech. So for us, this foray into the digital is like a completely new thing. But even the National Park Service now has mm -hmm. apps in their um, at least in their urban a lot of their urban um, like in DC and um, in Boston historic. Um, tours, so that's kind of a new thing for us. Um, and there was one other thing that so you just said that I was going to comment on. Water? No, the civic engagement part. Like, what do we want to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it really? What's the action that we want? And what I really, what I really see is like, okay, it's it's one thing to point out that these places are like 
rife with like many layers of invisible regulation or kind of like that our behaviors are affected somehow that we don't even think about it. And so it's one thing to look at that, but we're not really trying to complain about it. We're trying to say like, this is the city that exists. Like, mm -hmm. is this the city that you want? If you don't want this, like do something, you know, like speak up. Like let's, there's, 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 there's new, the city's always becoming, right? There, it, like on this historic tour we just went on today, the guide was sort of sh showing how it's amazing how you have something from the 1700s, the 1800s, 1900s to today all on one street, right? The city is always in the process of becoming. So we have this opportunity to create the city that we live in and I really, um, I really think like, yeah, just getting out there and going on a walk or like going on this um, parade and making things and just getting involved like you really can you can you can make a difference so I think you don't have to be like the urban planner you don't have to be the politician but you can ask for it and you can you can speak up so um, and I think that you know regardless of where we're coming at like foundationally from like our our, our um, backgrounds like what our disciplines are I think that ultimately it's the experience of the participants that really informs mm -hmm. what the work is. Mm -hmm. So you can't have what we do without the participants. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that experience of just like being together with strangers in your city is super powerful. Mm -hmm. Regardless of whether you get like that like slippage of nature and urban ranger and all like if you just like having a good time together with strangers in your city and and it, and it makes it that much more palatable, I just feel like that is so powerful. Yeah, and that's yeah. what we do yeah. on the procession. I'm sorry you didn't show any pictures of me. Because <laughs> really, Holly, yeah, it's all about me. Next time, okay. next time. Um, yeah, well, I guess um, that's very much part of what the procession is about. It's about getting people together and building that sense of community and stuff. And, you know, and the, the water thing is that, yeah, we are all connected. It doesn't matter who we are, you know, what our background is, we are really all connected through water and we all need to really sort of take, take note of that and care about it and um, take action. And it's been really gratifying. I was never very much of an activist at all before I got involved in, in um, Mashapog Pond. And the, the project actually started from, um, residents around the pond um, being concerned about fellow um, citizens that were fishing at the pond and um, taking the fish home. And those residents knew that the fish was not um, safe to eat, but the signs that were up were all in English and very text-laden. And so um, they complained to the health department and somebody in the health department was thinking outside the box and went to the arts council and said, do you have an artist who can work with the community um, to make new signs so that they're more universally understood. And that's kind of how this all started. Um, and it's, it's um, and so I just got very, very interested and um, felt like I can't leave after just doing this project. Um, and I'm grateful it's, it's, it's a wonderful place in the sense that there's an amazing history. It sort of says, explains the whole history of, of, of this country through that one little spot, which is pretty amazing. Um, but it's gratifying to know that, that um, a number of people have come together around this pond and that we're coming together before I came on, on to it, but that the, the responsible party is cleaning up this um, Gorham Silver Manufacturing site, which was um, a large pollutant in the pond. And I think it's, it's somewhat to, to um, a testament to the fact that, that these processions have raised a lot of attention. Yeah. And um, so it's, mm -hmm. it, I think it does, does work. Um, and one of the things um, I was thinking about in, in your talk, that it would be really interesting to have um, just introduced that idea um, to uh, some of the teachers we're working with. And just, you know, maybe instead of recess or in addition, of course, to recess, sorry about that, um, <laughs> is to just have, a, you know, have the kids go for a walk around the block. And, you know, some of these kids do walk to school and sort of just say what they notice. And sort of, and that would be a good precursor, actually, to the procession and that idea of walking through the neighborhood. So that was inspiring. Well, yeah, let's talk. Just, <laughs> you know, a little step. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see if anybody else has any. We've got some folks with microphones. If you want to raise your hands, we'll, um, Jackie. Yeah, 
Well, maybe you want to tell us who you are, so because not everybody knows everybody. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, I was just very impressed by everything uh, you all talked about here. I guess we'll stand up. Um, and uh, and and like Susan said, the things that are you have in common between you, and one thing that I I felt like I was noticing is this real um, continuum of of a difference, which I think is this really interesting, striking difference um, between the very hyper local over on the urban palm procession end to the LA urban rangers is kind of in the middle there, and then how Jane's Walk has gotten so international. Um, and I'm very interested in your kinds of decisions that you've made about scaling up or, or I don't know, franchising. Like I kept thinking about uh, urban rangers, there being a Providence urban ranger. I'm from New Orleans, I want a New Orleans urban rangers. Um, and so the decisions that you make to be super hyper local and feed the Mashbog ponds um, on the one hand, or going really international with Jane's Walk and, and um, how that plays into your you know, goals as an organization, et cetera. Why don't you start, Denise? Sure, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's such an interesting question because part of me, I, I, I feel a pang of jealousy almost when I'm listening to people talk about the local level because uh, I think what brings me to this work is, uh, is a love for where I live and an interest in, in you know, like really getting my hands um, you know, dirty and, and invested in community projects. But, uh, but it's the scale, all of, all of them are important and they all work together and my work is centrally concerned with the global movement and so uh, it, it means that I have to step back a little bit but it offers a really super vantage point um, to look at commonalities and to understand uh, how people are articulating their desires for their cities and, uh, and it gives us the ability to connect to be a peer-to-peer -peer network where we uh, introduce people to each other to help them move their own initiatives forward, uh, where there's an uptake from, of one idea in a new city um, and where there's, a, where there's a conversation about how some approaches might work in some places that have similar climates or politics. Um, and some, sometimes why climate or politics um, uh, and social pressure doesn't allow the same kinds of transitions because we love talking about, uh, you know, in architecture and landscape architecture, toolkits, things that we can use that are replicable. But it's not always a perfect, um, it's not always a perfect system. You can't take things and stamp them in, in each place. So you really, really need the hyperlocal to bring context and, uh, and uh, like a, a considered, um, view of whatever you're, you're embarking on. Uh, so I, I love that and I think in the global project we've been trying to think about how to offer people capacity um, through local organizations to think about embedding uh, Jane's Walk as part of annual programming in, uh, um, in New York City at the Municipal Arts Society. Um, in Providence it was a student at the, um, it was Nate uh, uh, Storing uh, who was a, a colleague of many of you. Uh, in um, Chicago, it's a sort of consortia of different organizations, the Friends of Downtown and the Newbury Library. Uh, in Calgary, it's a community foundation. So several different kinds of organizations that also have a, a shared or aligned value with the project, um, taking it under their wing and offering it scale and scope and support. Um, so that's really interesting work for us because it means that we get to see all of this stuff come out of whatever um, magic is in the community conversation um, by, uh, by, by looking at scale and looking at capacity. Um, for us, our project um, has been focused on Los Angeles, but it's not exclusive to Los Angeles. Um, but I really feel like being starting out in, in LA is really the perfect place to be looking at this, these issues because you had said um, just in your earlier response that in Toronto, people giving the walks kind of assume they can go anywhere and that they're a public. That, I wouldn't say that's the case in, in LA that people assume that they can go anywhere. I, I think that is completely like culturally, like completely different in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's really, um, a, a really a place that celebrates its private spaces. And um, so it's, it's just a fascinating place to really um, delve into these issues. But we have, um, we have been, uh, when we've been invited to other places, we've, we've, uh, we've given um, hikes in New York and um, Stockholm and, as my introducer said, in the Netherlands. And um, some of the, the cultural differences with the other countries, you know, not everybody has the same relationship to nature as we do with our national parks. So mm -hmm. in, um, when we were in Sweden, for instance, um, 
the, all the other, all the um, Scandinavian countries have this concept of that that you can walk anywhere across anyone's land. You can um, camp for like a certain number of days, and you can pick mushrooms and stuff. So like the idea of having like a ranger telling you like where you can go and you can't go is like that's like not really part of their culture. But we um, we had like a we gave a workshop to um, like planners and landscape architects in Stockholm, and we asked them to you know, create a program that would be something similar to the Rangers in, in, a, in a way that, that would work for them. And they, found, and they had come to LA and they, they went on our Malibu um, beaches um, safaris and they were like, I can't believe people are putting up all these signs that say it's a private beach but it's not a private beach and don't, I can, that would never happen in Sweden. Then they went around Stockholm, the waterway, and they found out they had the exact same issue. Like all of the, all of the docks, you know, they say you actually can go on the docks. Mm -hmm. Um, for, as a matter of safety, and they all say that they're private. So there, there are issues. Um, and then when we were in the Netherlands, um, they don't really have the, the same idea of like urban and nature because so much of the Netherlands is like created. Mm -hmm. The land is created. So they have like this forester um, figure who is really like seeding the polder with the, you know, with the beginning species and then the, the next layer of, of trees and then the birds come and so it's like a really interesting um, idea. So for us, I mean, I, and I know there are sort of other projects, uh, ranger type projects in other cities that I've heard about that people have told me about. For us it's just a matter of, of uh, you know, uh, bandwidth, I mean, yeah. for us to expand. I think, I think we've got a lot to, to cover just in LA. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, well, hyper-local here. Um, uh, I, I think the reason that I've stayed so close to Mashbog because it, it is so rich in terms of its history, um, and we've, I, I really want to address depth, and working with the, um, with the schools is, is, a, is wonderful, but it's, it's, um, it takes a while for, for teachers to get on board and to then think about really incorporating this. But I think that's where it could be richest, is really working with these think. teachers. And because they will carry this on to share with other students. And just part of what I'm kind of trying to do is, is and, and actually the school board is kind of on board with this, and, and of course they listen to me, of, of course. But, um, <laughs> um, but in talking to the science curriculum coordinator for Providence Public Schools, she said, yeah, we really want teachers to start looking right outside their classrooms and have the kids focusing on um, what's right around their classroom. So it it's, was a beautiful yeah. you know, kind of marriage, because that, that's what I just think is really important, because as we know, it's, it's important to, to kind of really share what we notice and to notice where we live, and there's so much to learn there. And but so I, yeah. In some ways, it always seems to me that the urban pond procession is the global in the local, because mm -hmm. when you go to the urban pond procession, it's amazing. There are people from everywhere. I mean, yeah. only 300 people, and you think, my goodness, they're from 300 and countries. And they're all ages. You know, you know, and all ages. So, right. I mean, in some ways, it's that mix of global and local that Jane's Walk is doing. You, mm -hmm. I mean, Providence is really, the, the local is global these days. You know, it's this, you, don't, you don't introduce school kids to the world. They've been there. Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> it's you who've lived in Providence too long <laughs> if you think it's, you know, provincial. <laughs> Because um, they come from all over, so. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, you know, getting that into the school system yeah. to honor that, mm -hmm. that's really important, and, and that takes, takes, a, takes a while. Um, and, and we have had, just this past summer, we had a, a workshop for teachers to share our approach, and hopefully, um, and these, for teachers, not just in Providence. And the Department of Environmental Management really is trying to push me out of Providence and to work with um, some other schools in other parts of the state. So um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Michelle Moon. I come from the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem Maths and oversee okay. some tour programs there. And um, one thing that strikes me, I would love to hear each of you talk about audience. Um, how do you think about audiences? Do you have the audiences that you're aiming for? Are there people you're not seeing that you would like to see? Uh, and how do you go about you know, marrying the type of content you want to present with your current and potential audience? 
and how do you engage them on the tours with each other? Well, uh, for us, I, I really, um, I really don't use the word audience. I use the word participant, and it's really a big difference because, um, as I was saying earlier, like our project doesn't like the art of it is actually the participant involvement. So, like these spaces don't become public unless you have the public there. Um, so, for 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 us, we are so happy with all ages that show up and. Um, genders and ethnicities. It really depends on, um, you know, what day of the week we're doing it and, you know, what time of day. Um, like when we did the Saturday afternoon, we had a lot more families, whereas with Thursday night, it was like mostly um, adults without kids. So um, I think, you know, so a lot of the stuff we do can be read at more than one level and, and enjoyed at more, more than one level. So I think we're um, we're pretty happy with, with who we're working with, although everything's in English. I mean, except for we have translated our guide into Spanish. Um, and uh, and um, the idea of an authority figure for some of our Latin, Latino audiences is not as accessible of a figure um, as, it, as it is for the others, although the National Park Service is also doing, they're actually, they've actually reached out to us in, in some of their urban um, encounters of really trying to figure out how do you reach an urban audience. So um, we've actually consulted with the National Park Service. So. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, like we, we were mimicking you and now you're mimicking us. <laughs> it's hilarious. Anybody else want to talk about audience? Are you done? Uh, for for us, we so there's a couple things. Our walk leaders, uh, we have city organizers, uh, the people in each city who take who lead the charge and who uh, liaise with the media and and orchestrate everything. And uh, and that's a very specific type of person. And we found that the early adopters, uh, you know, when the project started was. Uh, were people that were familiar with Jane Jacobs' ideas. And now that it's grown to 189 cities, um, it is mostly people who are well-traveled who kind of blow this project out and take it to new places where they visit. Um, you know, several uh, North Americans from both the U.S. and Canada who travel or settle uh, in other parts of the world who then instigate the project. And so, um, you know, in terms of city organizing, the, uh, we've been really fortunate that we, that we just have a really well-traveled roster of people um, moving the project around and then, and then making, making it different in each, each place that they land. Um, and then in terms of walk leaders, so there's three, I guess there's three. It's, it's city organizers, our walk leaders, and then the participants on the tour themselves. Um, the walk leaders, we have, uh, we, we talk about how to engage people by, um, by geography. Uh, and I think that grew out of, uh, uh, you know, what is the best sort of, uh, what is the lowest common denominator of organizing, what's the easiest to do, uh, what are those natural community networks. Uh, and sometimes that's disrupted uh, when people are using Twitter and, uh, and Facebook to, to organize at different scales, uh, and that'll be across geography. But the most natural one for Jane's Walk is definitely uh, neighbor to neighbor, and, uh, and, and that's how people pull in engagement. Um, and we, we do, we think a lot about um, accessibility uh, questions, um, not only around physical access to the tours, I mean it's called Jane's Walk, but it is a Jane's Roll, a Jane's Ride. Uh, we've had people who use assistive communication devices uh, lead tours and, uh, and we've had people talk about um, PTSD and, uh, and talk about uh, being being blind um, and and understanding monuments through sound and uh, sharing perspectives like that is uh, you know is a is a great deal about how we make uh, a really um, how we start to make complex the things that need to be complex which is that we all have a different reading of these urban landscapes and they should be talked about as such. Um, we engage youth uh, through a K-12 program called the Jane's Walk School Edition, and if anybody wants information about that, it's at janeswalk.org schools. We have uh, 
um, a program that reaches out. Uh, I talked a lot about newcomers. I think that's an issue that's quite close to me. Um, but we we do a lot of work to think about how you know when do you f citizen is sometimes a really weird label. Like when is it that you feel like you are you belong there and that you can talk about it with some authority. So. Uh, so we, we had a gentleman lead a walk um, after 17 weeks of living in Toronto and, uh, and you know initially he was saying I'm really interested in this but I mean I don't know about this place I've just moved here and I said but isn't that an interesting perspective like you just moved here what is your take on it and what you know where are there gaps or who were the first services and uh, who were the first networks that you connected with. Um, so uh, in the video you saw the refugee walk which was really similar to that. People who, uh, who don't even have legal status who are talking about um, their experience because they're just as, uh, that, that voice is just as legitimate in the conversation. So, um, so we, I wouldn't call them targets but we try and lay out for our city organizers a number of different um, participants uh, that should lead walks, voices to, to pull forward um, uh, you know, as part of creating a, um, a socially just conversation. Um, so we, I, I would love to talk more about that. It's something that and now I'm going to borrow from you and I'm going to say I, we're, we're still asking that question. Yeah. We're always asking that question. Yeah. Um, so it, uh, audience, I guess, for, or for us, I mean, I feel similarly to you is that, um, you know, everybody becomes part of the procession and that creates the procession. Um, but um, I was recently in LA and um, there's a principal that I worked with at Reservoir Elementary School who is now a principal in LA and she's, she's, she um, drove an hour, I guess people do that in LA, but um, <laughs> to come in and see me um, because she really loved what I was doing um, at, at, at Reservoir which was to, to have the kids de design this um, interactive play space with storm drain runoff in mind and to really educate people about about water and storm drain runoff and how it affects the ponds and that kind of thing. And she said, Holly, you've just really got to do more. <laughs> and um, um, she, so she went through her, her, you know, Rolodex and her phone and, you know, was just giving me um, names of people to contact here in Providence from the Latino community because she says you really need to be working with that community more. And so, um, you know, I, I listen and I, you know, um, we'll be working on trying to really reach into that community more to, to increase that, that audience. And it's not just being in the procession, it's also learning. And so that's always my struggle is, you know, trying to figure out a way to teach, but also to celebrate. So it's that balance. Cool. Somebody over here have a question? Dress up. And there is, you know, I like what you said, Holly, about getting out of your own comfort zone. Could you talk a little bit how, how that uh, influences the experience of, of your organization, of your tour? Um, well, I think, um, as you saw in the video, um, we, we started that year at Alvarez High School and the, the cafeteria was just, um, was large and then we had just laid out all the um, instruments that had been made over the years and the um, fish costumes and things. And, you know, we just invite people to come in and find something that they want to wear. And so it just, it, um, it creates a sense of kind of openness and, and play. And um, it's not a, maybe a, a costume that they have made, but it's, it's the collective, you know, creation of, of um, over the years of various different um, kids that have made these. Um, and it's, it's, it allows people to kind of, as well, as you said, you know, enter enter into a sort of a new identity in a way and that's that's full of sort of possibility and openness that, that I think creates a, um, a real sense of, okay, I can do this in a different way and everybody's kind of just trying these things on and talking with each other and it just creates a sense of oneness <coughs> that we lack in our, our everyday lives in which we're in our little slots. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Because why do you dress up as Urban Ranger? <laughs> well, you know, it allow a couple of a couple of things happen when we dress up. Um, one thing is, as I said in my talk, like the Park Ranger figure is extremely recognizable and a very accessible, friendly figure. And so we don't just you know put the clothes on; we actually inhabit that identity, that persona. And um, 
from the participant from the participant point of view, I think what it does is allows them to just take that leap with you and just go with you on that idea that the city is a place of nature, without having to overthink it, um, and they just they just go with you, and they really look at us as um, you know as guides in the city. So when I'm giving you know, a, a, a hike of the LA River, I get other questions about where things are in the city, you know, where the metro stop is and stuff like that. I'm just like considered, you know, to know. Um, the other thing that happens is, um, we especially noticed this in Malibu, which is such a contested space. And um, so, I mean, we were like, we've been like threatened with lawsuits by, you know, the homeowners there and, you know, people will come out and be really angry or there'll be security guards. And we're there with um, our participants and they, our participants feel safe because they're with us and we're showing them where to go. And then our reaction to the, um, to the animosity is very even keeled. Right, because a, a park ranger is like, you know, giving a, a hike in uh, Moab and they've got like, you know, someone from the NRA and they've got like a, you know, a peace dove. Like, and they're, they're, it's the public's, it's all of theirs, right? So you have this really, really great, uh, and this is something we didn't know when we started it, but is this, you have this really great like democratic figure that's really trying to see, um, not only looking at, looking at your everyday space with new eyes, but really trying to see another point of view. Um, so that's been really successful for us. I'd say, you know, we started out in an art, just like as a one-time exhibit in an art show. And um, people were like, so when can we go on a hike? You know, and we were like, this is just like for the show. And so I think like the believability of that figure has extended this project to be like it's 11 years old now, so. We may have time for one more, Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Epstein. I'm a producer of um, mobile walkable media. And I also teach a course uh, at an art college titled Landmarks, Memory, and Mobile Media. And one of the things that we struggle with in the course is really conveying to students, you know, what is powerful story, you know, and what makes a story effective and fresh and interesting. And I think story has a component in, in all of your work. And I'd be interested in hearing, you know, what for you makes a story powerful or interesting and, and give specific examples, if you have it, of how, how that fits into your work. Thank you. Denise, who, who leads the best tours? <laughs> I, think, I think when people when people open up and they share something personal about themselves, I called it vulnerability in my presentation, and I, I've gotten a bit of pushback from some people about that word. I, the, I, I'm, so, I'm still working with how to articulate it, but I, but I think that it's if you open up uh, to, to your neighbors or a circle of strangers uh, and, and you tell a story from a really personal place about something that happened to you, uh, then the, it changes the texture of the conversation almost immediately. And so I would, uh, and, and it also May, it also forms an understanding that we're not glossing, you know, we're not we're not trying to give a veneer to these uh, to these tours. We're not trying to make this something that it's not. It's not only a celebration all the time. Often there are critiques. Often that there are challenges, um, and uh, and so coming from a really personal place is is always important. So specifically, um, I'm thinking of. Uh, a, a woman who was giving a tour about, uh, or who was asked to speak on a tour, so she was one stop along the way, um, and she offered her perspective of opening up a new business, and uh, and she told her story of how, uh, again, she immigrated to uh, to Canada, and then she talked about um, you know, all the logistics pieces, and she thought that that was going to be very boring, but in fact, it was so successful because she was uh, she was not saying that if one wants to open a business, one should do this. She was saying, I did this. And here were the challenges I faced. And actually, then I went and I met this guy. His name is, and we ended up talking. And he helped me through this process. And it was, um, you know, we got such good feedback about that because it really, I, I even for people that didn't need to be equipped with a roadmap or weren't necessarily going to be doing the same thing, uh, it, you know, they people were able to connect as um, 
as human beings and, and as, as, uh, as, as friends after that, there's a real bonding experience that happens. Uh, and so we check in with people often and, uh, and find out that they've gone on to, to host collaborations or to have people uh, you know, uh, sell things at their stores or, um, or to come up with not like com completely new festivals and ideas uh, because, of that, because of that opening, that vulnerability, that sharing of a personal story. So I, I would say that that's the thing for me that makes good story. Um, I really appreciate your question. I think it's so relevant to what we do. And um, when, we're, when we're putting together a program, sometimes we don't know what, which parts of it are really going to stick, um, and uh, or and so I, you know, sometimes it really just takes like who shows up, like what is really important to them and what makes it work for them. But I totally agree with you that I think there's when there's a personalized element to um, what we're doing, whether it's from the stories that we tell or the activities that we have the people do to actually have a personalized experience. I think that um, that's what makes the, the strongest um, memory and takeaway. Um, yeah, I totally feel that story is like the core. I mean, no, no. Um, I just, it, it's definitely, um, I, a painter actually by training and um, narrative was always the way that I went and um, trying to visually tell a story. Um, but, um, and, and as I say, these oral histories have been collected, um, roughly 50 of them. And, and I just think that people hearing other people's stories, it's a way for somebody to enter and understand another person. And um, so I think that's very important. And I, I recall one um, time in which I invited uh, two people to come in to a high school class and to tell the students, this was at Alvarez, um, about what it was like to grow up in this um, West Elmwood neighborhood, which was then bulldozed in 62. And, um, you know, the, these two guys just talked and talked, and like one would sort of start a story, the other one would finish it. I mean, they just really, really were collaborative storytellers in a kind of way, which is wonderful. Um, and um, so, in talking with the kids and looking at sort of some comments that they made after um, these guys were there, they they really loved hearing history through hearing the stories, and they sort of almost all of them were so impressed by the fact that that these guys could actually grow up in a place where they could leave their doors open and they were in and out of each other's homes and how they played outside and they just these these contemporary high school kids just really wished that they could have that. And, um, you know, I think that's pretty powerful for them to, well, it's powerful for me to realize how closed in these kids are, but um, also to, to realize that, that, you know, there are other, there have been other ways and hopefully we'll, we'll hopefully get there so that there is more openness like that, but being inspired by the past. One of the things I noticed of the three, and I'll, I'll just, um, Chair's prerogative, um, say that the, 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 other, the two other things that seemed to me to make the stories compelling were the connection to the bigger, the personal connection to a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether it's, um, um, you know, public, private, and what, what or, or the environment, or the refugee experiences, the personal, the personal stories help make the big, but you gotta have the bigger piece, mm -hmm. or there's, there's no reason to hear the personal stories. Oh, sure. The other one is the visual. Um, that the, the visual makes these stories so compelling that I, I know this when I'm at the urban bond procession. Um, so that the sculptures that float on the on the river and that and uh, on the river on the pond and and that that, that disappear. I mean the, the metaphors that are told visually are really make the stories very compelling. Yeah, I was just going to add that that for our project, I think that, you know it's the execution of it that um, you know that really helps tell the story. So like with the maps really showing um, showing the information in a new way or showing the land in a new way. But then, you know, also the uniform and, you know, the water bar. We have bartenders. So it's like you yeah. really have the experience. It's like looking at every detail of like really executing it so that you can understand that story. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you come back tomorrow. Thank our panel.